Welcome to Storytime with the UC Riverside Libraries, presented to you by the Finals Week Stress Relief Team. We're bringing you a series of exciting stories originally curated by the Brothers Grimm. Today's tale is about the power of magic. So sit back, relax, listen and read along if you like to The Sorcerer's Apprentice. More Tales from Grimm. Freely translated and illustrated by Wanda Gag. The Sorcerer's Apprentice A man found himself in need of a helper for his workshop, and one day, as he was walking along the outskirts of a little hamlet, he met a boy with a bundle slung over his shoulder. Stopping him, the man said, Good morning, my lad. I'm looking for an apprentice. Have you a master? No, said the boy. I have just this morning said goodbye to my mother, and am now off to find myself a trade. Good, said the man. You look as though you might be just the lad I need. But wait, do you know anything about reading and writing? Oh yes, said the boy. Too bad, said the man. You won't do after all. I have no use for anyone who can read and write. Pardon me, said the boy. If it was reading and writing you were talking about, I misunderstood you. I thought you were asking if I knew anything about eating and fighting. Those two things I am able to do well, but as to reading and writing, that is something I know nothing about. Well, cried the man, then you are just the fellow I want. Come with me to my workshop and I will show you what to do. The boy, however, had his wits about him. He could read and write well enough, and had only pretended to be a fool. Wondering why a man should prefer to have an unschooled helper, he thought to himself, I smell a rat. There's something strange about this, and I had better keep my eyes and ears open. While he was pondering over this, his new master was leading him into the heart of a deep forest. Here in a small clearing stood a house, and as soon as they entered it, the boy could see that this was no ordinary workshop. At one end of a big room, was a huge hearth with a copper cauldron hanging in it. At the other end was a small alcove lined with many big books. A mortar and pestle stood on a bench. Bottles and sieves, measuring scales, and oddly shaped glassware were strewn about on the table. Well, it did not take the clever young apprentice very long to realize that he was working for a magician or sorcerer of some kind, and so, although he had pretended to be quite stupid, he kept his eyes and ears open and tried to learn all he could. Sorcery, that is a trade I would dearly love to master, said the boy to himself. A mouthful of good chants and charms would never come amiss to a poor fellow like me, and with them I might even be able to do some good in the world. There were many things the boy had to do. Sometimes he was ordered to stir the evil-smelling broths which bubbled in the big copper cauldron. At other times, he had to grind up herbs and berries, and other things too gruesome to mention, in the big mortar and pestle. It was also his task to sweep up the workshop, to keep the fire burning in the big hearth, and to gather the strange materials needed by the man for the broth and brews he was always mixing. This went on day after day, week after week, and month after month, until the boy was almost beside himself with curiosity. He was most curious about the thick, heavy books in the alcove, how often he had wondered about them, and how many times he had been tempted to take a peep between the covers. But remembering that he was not supposed to know how to read or write, he had been wise enough never to show the least interest in them. At last there came a day when he made up his mind to see what was in them, no matter what the risk. I'll try it before another day dawns, he thought. That night he waited until the sorcerer was sound asleep and was snoring loudly in his bedchamber. Then, creeping out of his straw couch, the boy took a light into the corner of the alcove and began paging through one of the heavy volumes. What was written in them has never been told, but there were conjuring books, each and every one of them. And from that time on, the boy read in them silently, secretly, for an hour or two, night after night. In this way, he learned many magic tricks, chants and charms and counter charms, recipes for filters and potions, for broths and brews and witches' stews, signs, mystic and cabalistic, and other helpful spells of many kinds. All these he memorized carefully, 
and it was not long before he sometimes was able to figure out what kind of charms his master was working, what brand of potion he was mixing, what sort of stews he was brewing. And what kind of charms and potions and stews were they? Alas, they were wicked ones. Now the boy knew that he was not working for an ordinary magician, but for a cruel, dangerous sorcerer. And because of this, the boy made a plan, a bold one. He went on with his nightly studies until his head was swarming with magic recipes and incantations. He even had time to work at them in the daytime, for the sorcerer sometimes left workshop for hours, working harm and havoc on mortals, no doubt. At such times, the boy would cry out a few bits of his newly learned wisdom. He began with simple things, such as changing the cat into a bee and back to a cat again, making a viper out of the poker, an imp out of the broom, and so on. Sometimes he was successful, often he was not. So he said to himself, the time is not yet ripe. One day, after the sorcerer had gone forth on one of his mysterious trips, the boy hurried through his work and had just settled himself in the dingy alcove with one of the conjuring books on his knees when the master returned unexpectedly. The boy, thinking fast, pointed smilingly at one of the pictures, after which he closed the book and went on with his work as though nothing were amiss. But the sorcerer was not deceived. If the wretch can read, he thought, he may learn how to outwit me, and I can't send him off with a beating and a bad speed to you. Either doubtless he knows too much already and will reveal all my fine mean tricks, and then I can't have any more sport working mischief on man and beast. He acted quickly. With one leap, he rushed at the boy, who in turn made a spring for the door. Stop! cried the sorcerer. You shall not escape me! He was about to grab the boy by the collar, when the quick-witted lad mumbled a powerful incantation by which he changed himself into a bird, and whoosh! He had flown into the woods. The sorcerer, not to be outdone, shattered a charm, thus changing himself into a larger bird, and whoosh! He was after the little one. With a new incantation, the boy made himself into a fish, and whish! He was swimming across a big pond. But the master was equal to this, for, with a few words, he made himself into a fish too, a big one, and swam after the little one. At this, the boy changed himself into still a bigger fish. But the magician, by a master stroke, turned himself into a tiny kernel of grain, and rolled into a small crack in a stone where the fish couldn't touch him. Quickly, the boy changed himself into a rooster, and peck, 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 with a sharp beak, he snapped at the kernel of grain and ate it up. That was the end of the wicked sorcerer, and the boy became the owner of the magic shop. And wasn't it fine that all the powers and ingredients which had once been used for evil by the sorcerer were now in the hands of a boy who would use them only for the good of man and beast? The End Well, I hope you enjoyed today's Brothers Grimm installment. I know I did. You can find many more titles like this by visiting the UC Riverside Library catalog at library.ucr.edu. See you next time.